No more clickbait, no more sound bites, and no more videos that are over before you blink. No more being told to click this or to share that because some people think you can't think. Choose a new way of doing things. Choose real people. Choose real stories. Choose the Real Talks podcast. A four-time All-Ireland winner with Dublin, Kevin McMenamin has become a key cog in the blue machine that has dominated Gaelic football throughout this decade. In that period, he's developed an interesting knack for scoring memorable goals at crucial moments and is adored by Dublin fans for his directness and instinctive play. But as you're about to hear, there's a lot more to Kevin than just his exploits on the field. And truth be told, when I had the idea to set up this podcast, he was one of the very first names that came to mind. Among other things, we spoke about his struggles with performance anxiety that held him back from reaching his potential in earlier years. And he talks openly and honestly about how influential sports psychology has been for his development, both as an athlete and more importantly, as a person. We chatted about his love for music, how he maintains a balanced lifestyle and the importance of resilience, particularly when it comes to mental health education of young people. This podcast is brought to you thanks to the support of Kelly Bradshaw Dalton, who for over 20 years have been successfully selling, renting and managing property in the Greater Dublin area. You can check out their website at kbd.ie, that's kbd.ie, for all your property needs. My name is Alan O'Mara and you are listening to the first ever episode of the Real Talks podcast. Would unsettle all of that. It's a free kick. Kian O'Sullivan. Under seven minutes to go. Alan Brogan sent in. McMenamin dodging. McMenamin yes! scoring! There's a point between the teams. And Kevin McMenamin has kicked a beauty and sent Dublin fans into raptures. 64 minutes on the clock. Beautiful pass, wonderful work, precision here by McMenamin. He made a difference in the semi-final. And when he took the pass from Brogan here, he's made a difference in the final itself. Rounding Declan O'Sullivan and beating Brendan Keeley. 110 to 19. It ain't over yet. Wonderful I'm gonna jump into that 2011 final against Kerry. I think won your your fondness for a goal. That's obviously a, f- a good memory in your mind or a good moment in the Dublin jersey. But actually, I watched that clip. There was a few things stood out in it. And one was actually Alan got that turnover. And you're standing about 10 yards to the right of him at that stage. And you can see you, the two years are like, it's go time. And the two years run up along the right wing. You're both waving, like holding your hands out at each other. And eventually the ball finds its way to you just outside the 21. What's in your mind there? Um, very little. Um, there was, uh, I suppose, I was just, I was, I was very, very worried, very worried. Um, I remember looking at him going, "Give me the thing earlier." Yeah. I wanted it a lot so, earlier. I remember the twos are literally standing there yeah. going, "I'm here." Um, just something about him, he, his time, and I should have trusted his timing a bit more because it worked out well for him. Uh, what was, what was in my mind? My mind was, was, was goal time. Was, was have a go at it, yeah. And it's funny. Um, I remember I kind of did a jink inside and I'm kind of thinking, gee, I couldn't believe it. This, this, this is on here. And I'll never forget the day before we were um, we were doing a bit of goal practice, um, myself and Mossy Quinn, and just just kind of getting the eye in. And Mossy says to me, do you notice that you're lifting your body, you're lifting your head up really quick before you actually were follow through on the ball. Right. And I was like, geez, that's what I'm doing because what I was nearly wanted to see the ball going you in. You wanted to see your goal. Yeah, <laughs> and I was lifting and it was putting me off balance and I'd missed one in train the week before um, that had, uh, went high, hit the post um, and I do like to keep them down. So it was, he just said, I go, well, what would you do? And he basically had just said, just make sure you keep the head down and follow through. Mm. And that's the only thing that I thought about. So I, just keep it. I, didn't, I never even saw the thing going in because I just kept the head down, made sure I followed through, got a good strike on it. So. The, the thing I was laughing at actually as I was watching it was, I think Mick McCauley's running on the inside yeah, mm. and Berno's pointing at Mick telling you to, to slip it to Mick. And I think mm. most players in that, they're all, we're all coached now are taught to slip it to the one over. And mm. I can, like, you're like, you're absolutely 
most single minded focus man that I think mm. I've ever seen in a football field and it's boom goal time and I think what I was laughing at them was you're running out and you start doing the, you start doing the classic point in the head you know focus yeah. focus and I suppose that sort of that brings me on to my next point around I suppose the, the sports psychology or the or the mental fitness aspect of it and I think that's would it be fair to say that's been a key part of your development over the years or something that you focused on or prioritised yeah uh, very, very much so. I'd be a huge. Uh, I've been a huge beneficiary of of mental skills, um, and yeah, I suppose it's. it's I just. I. I don't think I'd be playing kind of for Dublin without it. That was kind of more of a. You. Re- you. You genuinely believe that that's. You wouldn't be playing without that. No, and I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't be still playing. I wouldn't have got there. I don't think if I didn't have a couple of interventions in my club. Um, in terms of taking that next level into the senior, to see myself as a senior footballer, but uh, again, I was my my thing was a severe lack of confidence and performance anxiety was my kind of trouble, and I just that's when you make the breakthrough. Yeah, more of my debut season. You know, I've, I found it difficult to, uh, to to relax in Crow Park. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I t- I just thought that you know I, I traditionally saw myself as a big game player growing mm-hmm. up, and I used to be very confident. And growing up, I was. I had a good record of man to match in finals. Okay. So I kind of, that was a nice thing to bring in, but whatever way it was in Crow Park, I had had it on the pedestal a little bit as to, um, yeah, as to, as, this is this was the dream. I mean, the dream was to actually stand out there rather than to play well out so, there. Like, as know? in Crow, getting to Crow Park was the end goal rather than the beginning of the journey. Is that Absolutely. Makes sense, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, have, I have something that I want to show you here, and I think, is that your... Is that your championship debut? That's my debut there, right there. Yeah. Against Wexford in 2010. Mm. And I, Joe, suppose, I think it's Joey Wadding, mark me. If, uh, Wexford guy. So the picture that I have, like anyone listening, which is what I'm showing you, is, is, is you and Croker with a, a very youthful looking Kev uh, with, a, with a slightly tighter haircut and less of a quiff. A couple uh, of extra kilos on me as well. <laughs> and the other one is, is, is you after the all Ireland final this year holding Sam up and Croker. And I think you touched upon the sort of the performance anxiety and and just learnings that you had to take, sort of that we all some of us some of us have to learn as, as mm. we get thrown into those environments. What's the big difference between that Kev on the ball against Wexford running down the pitch, and that one looking smiley and happy after an All Ireland final in 2016? Um, very clever. I like the I like the two pictures. I suppose <laughs> what's the difference? It, it, the difference is probably mainly that I learned to understand what's going on in my body when I'm playing matches. Mm. You know what's going on in my brain and. That when I get that bit of fear, that bit scared, uh, how to respond to it? So, you know, I, I beat it into me that I love pressure, that I that I love the challenge of performing on a big day. Um, again, I love the uh, the fact that I I get energized uh, before a, you know a competition. Um, so that's kind of one of them, I suppose. In terms of my own when confidence, you say, when you say energized, there, though, just. Are you are you talking the classic butterflies in the stomach? Is that what you're touching on? Or yeah, well, it's it's true. Well, I, I, my the way my um, performance anxiety shows is through through doubt. Is it through uh, and through muscle tension? You okay. Know? Uh, so you know, everyone. Some people get butterflies. Some people get the heart goes. You, you don't want to know what mine is. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, my breath goes a lot quicker and things right. like that. So I control have to do control my breath to do breathing stuff. Okay. Um, and that was kind of initially the thing that I started to love the love the pressure um, and just recognizing those changes in your body and understanding what was going on. Yeah, that was part of it. And then um, I suppose then the big one that was kind of nearly at a couple of levels, a couple yeah. of big chats. I had a very great chat one day uh, with Caroline Currid, who who I would have looked up to, and he sure. would have been a great guide f- uh, for me. Um, but it was twenty twelve when um, you know I had the All Ireland in the pocket, and I was starting, and I was playing well in Lancer Championship games, but I still still getting nervous, still getting this mm. this crippling anxiety. And we had a great chat, a long chat one day out in a hotel out in Minute. And I'll always thank her for sticking with me that day yeah. because she got to the root of what my problem was. And nearly, it would have been very difficult to see because I would have cloaked it very well, mm. but no confidence in me football. I was a very confident fella okay. in terms of my own social life. And in terms of my personal life, going out and doing things, but for some reason, I would talk myself down a lot when mm. I when I when I played football. So it was wouldn't I discount kind of my good performances. So I remember I had two man of the matches in Leinster uh, in twenty twelve, 
And it was kind of like, rather than, you know what, you were good today, you know, fair play to you, it was more, ah, uh, sure, you weren't marking a great fella because they were all marking, yeah. they were double marking Burno or Connolly or, Jez, you got lucky it, with that guy. Just goal. talking yourself down. Like. Or, Jez, you, you geez, that was a fluke, fluke, you know, you just you just put the foot through that one, you didn't place that one or whatever. And you just, it was nearly a light bulb moment for me. Mm. I was like, geez, I don't need to work my confidence. And my self-talk was completely... Um, upside down okay you know it was like the upside down pyramid the, the positive stuff was it's the complete wrong way like. was, 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 I was given 10% positives and 90% being hard on myself um, probably because I don't know maybe I was taught that way um, is, like it, I, is, is, is it something to do is it a little bit just the Irish psyche at times as well and like oh yeah you're a grand lad but you did this and you did that and yeah. it's that classic but yeah. and then pause and it's, it's very true like and and I think if we nearly looked at percentage of conversations where we're hard on ourselves, mm-hmm. and look, we all need to be hard on ourselves. You need to know what you, what, you, what you need to grow at. But I suppose when you spend all your time thinking about that and it seeps in, and what it was doing for me was chiseling away at my confidence rather than I was taught it was motivating me. So if I'm hard on myself, I'll train harder yeah. on Tuesday or I'll kick nearly under the pro- balls. Nearly prove myself wrong. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so instead of just going, okay, we all know what we need to improve on. But actually, giving giving myself some credit. So, and I think it was probably what I figured out in hindsight was my heroes were Roy Keane and Michael Jordan. Yeah. Now, looking back, could you find two athletes <laughs> that are harder on themselves? Yeah. Probably not. But they're they're not they're not just they're not cut from the same cloth as me. They're 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 different animals. Sure. So, uh, again, I don't think I ever need motivation to train. I'm very driven. Uh, I, I want to get better every week. But so I'm a lot. I'm a lot nicer to myself these days. It's, you know? uh, no, I think for a certain part of an athlete's development, like there definitely is a time where you've got to be hard on yourself and you've mm. got to say, what do I need to improve? But as well as that, I think there does come a stage where you need to start sort of loving yourself a bit as well and going, do you know what? Like, I'm really good. Like, I'm good yeah, at this. Yeah. And you've got to get that balance right. And the reason that I was sort of asking about the anxiety and the, the performance issues was, I think it's something that the large majority of sports people will have, but sometimes we all just bury and pretend we're just naturally deadly, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I remember, it was, I remember we played... We played London in Crow Park in 2013 myself and there was a, a ball dropped in the edge of the square and it ended up getting slapped into the goal. For about five, ten minutes in that game, I was eating myself alive going, should have came for that, should have got that. And I remember getting home and was just in an absolute, like, the whole the negative thing was just vroom, vroom, vroom. And I got home, game was recorded on telly, watched the thing about ten times in a row. And I remember just snapping and going like, like what am I doing? Like, mm. And even as I looked, the more I looked at it, like, it, was, it was one of these freak balls that, you know, I probably, I probably if I could rewind the clock I probably wouldn't have gone for it anyway but I just got lost in that mm. and later on that year because it was something that really that moment really stuck with me like and we played Kerry the following week and even led to a lot more doubts going into that game yeah. I let it eat at me but was the, the all Ireland final that year you was played that 2013 did you play Mayo that year in the final yeah, yeah. and Berno scored 2-3 and I, I remember I was watching that game because I was working there I remember watching Bernard and I remember thinking will I ever be able to to be like that because he just looked like this zen state mm. and it was just one of those moments where I remember just thinking like like he's in the zone yeah, you know we talk yeah. about the zone and exactly like, yeah, like, yeah. and I'm just like, but I think like, don't get me wrong I'd imagine Bernard has had plenty of nerves and anxiety over the years but mm. I remember just looking at it going like that's the way to play football like you're yeah. just you just seem present that felt very there was a destiny to that I think a man the match in the All-Ireland final I think yeah yeah I think so yeah he was great that day yeah he yeah, was just he was top notch I suppose one of the things I would certainly associate with you of on the field is that knack for goals or that sort of, I don't know if you call it a love for goals or a desire for goals. Mm. I don't even know if I've said this to you before, but I remember like we were both in DIT together around the same time. And I think it was, I was fresher in 2009. And I remember there was a, there was a sevens blitz thing going on and it was like, you were, you were rounded up by your county. So I was part of the Cavan team and you were playing on the South Dublin team. Okay. And I don't know if you, you remember this. I remember but, uh, that in Grange Gorman. Yeah, it was up in Grange Gorman. Mm-hmm. It was like, this was, this was, it was sevens. It was small goals going across the pitch, whatever it was. And we had to play you in one of the games. And I had no idea who you are. I'd never heard you before. I'd never seen you before. But I remember coming off the pitch and going to one of the lads, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like, you must have put about five goals past me. And I'm like, Where, who is this chap? Like, yeah, that, yeah. like you're in your goal poaching dream. Like, it was just like, I remember yeah. just one across the goal, bang. Big you know, goal, I, I, small I, For pitch. some reason, I just remember this because it was uh, so it was that real confined pitch and I was playing with a few different boys from home. And it, that was, so it was 2009. Mm. So I'm like, who the hell is this fella? 
Mm. And then I think 2010, you actually make the breakthrough with Dublin then. Is that right? Yeah, well, like 2009 was kind of the... 2008, I was injured for the whole year, mm. really. Uh, but um, So that was I had a good Sigerson and Gilroy kind of had me in in 2009, mm. the odd time during the summer. And he reckoned I wasn't up to the pace of it. So I had it went off to... Did you agree with that? Not really. I think he, he, he was more, it was more the fitness thing. You know, maybe, maybe I wasn't. The, the, the level they were at, they were kind of Leinster semi-final. Mm. Uh, at that stage, when I when I was when I was kind of in, they had a development squad around that time. I think gated football is starting to go really towards the fitness end as well, isn't it? Mm. Like the fitness levels are really shooting up. Yeah, like fitness was never a, a huge problem for me. I always had a good engine, and I always, I do like, I do always make sure I train on my own just to make sure I, I, I do like staying fit, like mm. so I can I can run. Um, so that was that summer, and Gilroy kind of said, "No, listen, we'll have a look at you again." So I went off to Chicago for. Couple of months, did as, you? as you do, yeah. yeah. I did my did second play, stint. Did you play out there? I played over with Parnells in Chicago, yeah. yeah. So, the great summer. And when I came back, then uh, we went on a big run with the club, and that coincided. We got to the final. I had, a, I had my best, probably, club season I'd say ever. I haven't had a good se- a, 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 as good a season since. And got to the final, and that coincided with Dublin losing to Kerry in the All Ireland semi final, getting hammered. So, mm. Gilroy needed to kind of go with new guys. So I'm blessed and ever thankful that he he went with me as one of them. But there was probably ten of them. Yeah. Ten new guys that year that he went with, like some myself and Macaulay and James McCarthy and uh Mick Fitz. Uh Keno Sullivan kind of started coming sure. in and um a few others that were kind of a bit edgy. The likes of Macaulay and Fitzy like aren't mm. traditionally, you know, what you would have seen. Yeah, they weren't even as Dublin footballers. Yeah, but um, I think he liked something. They weren't flash enough. They weren't. Maybe yeah, <laughs> they, they had an edge. We had a kind of an, a bit of an edge yeah. about us uh, that that you know dovetailed well into the guys that were there, the the season guys, and you know he he wanted guys who'd push the likes of Brogan, who was who was under pressure at the time, mm. uh, Bernard, and the likes of Colin Keeney and Dermo and things of like that. So, um, I think I think. That's one of Gilroy's things is that he that he 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 took guys and and was able to mould them into a great team. You've touched upon a lot of the, that, those skills that you've learned or that's added to you in your game, and I think for me anyway, that's how sports psychology has evolved in the modern day era. I think even when I start playing, so you're playing county minor, probably the same for you. Sports psychology was you got a once off talk from from a lad that came in or a woman that came in and just basically the manager expected everyone to be great and buzzing after it for a long period of time, but. I think the reality is like it was fairly low impact stuff like it might have been a kick and, mm. and some lads took one or two things from it but it wasn't you know, it wasn't planned or strategic you, has that role changed in your opinion over the last number of years yeah well I suppose there's, there, there is great kind of um, there's, a, there's a big misconception out there what kind of sports psychology actually is mm. um, and you know I suppose it, that's what that's what it was coming from was kind of one offs and you know there are there are there are certain scenarios where you can where one off chats and you know just giving it one or two things for a team to, to yeah, work on a boost. But like the really the, the way it really works is to have someone embedded in a team, uh, knowing the players, knowing what they're about. Because like it's not as simple as motivating someone or doing goal setting or building confidence, um, or you know teaching people how to react better to setbacks or to talk to themselves more positively. Like there's there's a big there's a lifestyle thing to it as well. So you know I I find a lot of the work I do with athletes is about their lifestyle. So you could be you could be having conversations with them about what's going on at home, what's going on in their heads, sure. what's uh, kind of what kind of state they're in, whether it's the you know they got the boot from the girlfriend or whatever it is. So you're kind of that there's that side of it as well that uh, I I kind of wasn't expecting when I went and it's it's something that I've really, really grown to enjoy. Uh, but I just think it's it's like. If you, if you ask a team, you know, what's the difference between winning and losing? Like, it's all about, they all say the intangible things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can't miss a um, a gym session or else you'll be lynched, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? But you can you can have a laissez-faire attitude towards mental toughness uh, or towards building mental skills. I don't see it. I don't see the, the reason for that. So I suppose coaches are starting to think differently a, a about it. Um uh, I suppose there probably needs to be m- m- more good sports psychs out there. Yeah. I suppose, um, and I'm hoping that I'm going to grow into a sure. a really good one. Um, like at the moment, if like if there's 
what's what sport are you working in at the moment? Because obviously, I'd imagine you're staying away from the, the GA circle a little bit, are you? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm trying to kind of get experience, and I get great experience from a range of sports mm-hmm. and just learning different cultures. And you know, I've spent time across. I've, I suppose I've met athletes from a lot of sports, so I've done work over the last couple of years with rugby. Okay. Um, again, a hugely different culture. Basketball. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really working this year in basketball, but uh, a great, great, uh, really enjoyable year with Temple Oak, who were the cup champions last year. Who I got a, a huge amount out of. Like we were, they had a start in five. They all played uh, in in college. Okay. Most 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 of them have played Division One college in America, um, and just guys that you'd rob so much from. Like I'm robbing so stuff. So they've from been to America from. for a couple of years and they're back mm. home. Is it? Yeah, like, they would the have Irish been guys. Yeah, like so. Like we've guys. There's a guy Connor Grace there who who I played who I uh, coached last year. Who was um, who was played in Division One th- with, with Davidson, which is mm-hmm. the college that Steph Curry went to. Um, and we've got uh, and and he's played all over the world. He's played in I think he's played in Greece, played in Malaysia. Right. A few guys. So Jace Killeen was a college guy. He's a Limerick guy who played in college over there. Again, been a pro all over the world. Mike Bonaparte, an unbelievable athlete who played in. I think it's called the University of Ozarks. Recently, a Hall of Famer, um, a really good guy. But they've they've got a lot of great, uh, even even um, uh, players that they blooded themselves and and have become Irish internationals. Stephen James, Gorka Murphy, these guys. I learned a huge amount from from so, from yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, so I just I had a really enjoyable year with those guys. I still keep in touch with some of them. I'm not cool. I'm not as as involved as I'd like to be. Again, time is a big thing. You know, you're trying to. It's hard to have two teams at one time, but you know you chat to you, you, I chat to a lot of individual athletes as well, whether it's golfers or in, in athletics and things like that. So it's nice. It's nice to have that um, different side of me, I suppose. It's not just about the guy, yeah. you know, which, no, is, which is a tempting thing great. to do. And I'll come to I'll come to that time and the balance thing in a second. I suppose just before I close off that that psychology aspect of of the conversation, like if a if a manager picks up the phone and gives you a shout and says, listen, I'd like you to come in and, and do a bit of work with our team. What What's the primary thing you see as, as you're rolling in there? What's what's the thing you go going and go, I'm going to make a difference with this? Because you mentioned about getting more good psychologists out there. Just just from your own perspective, what what is the, what does that mean to you, I suppose, is what I'm asking? Um, well, okay, well, the, the most important thing is, is the relationship with the, with the coach, I would think. Um, that's what I've found is... Will the coach, is the coach ticking a box or is the coach actually mm-hmm. want to embed in? So the, the coach init- the coach eventually should should be uh, training mental skills rather than you. So you're trying to educate the coach. Uh, I think that's one of the big things. Um, what do you want to do with, with players? See, it's it's so broad, I suppose. Um, in terms of the things, you know, when you look at mental toughness, it's about control. So understand you can control your own performances to an extent. Uh, understand you can control your own emotions uh, in terms of the, the highs and lows of a game, which pl- players don't do. How much of that, from your perspective, is studying in Jordanstown, yeah? Yeah. And playing. How much, where's the balance in that when you're, when you're working with someone? Um, in terms of uh, where I've got my learnings from? or Yeah, just your own, because I know, look, no, you answered you yeah, answer the question well, um, first, and I'll tell you why. Um, <laughs> well, where is it from? I suppose... I, picked up a lot from college college was probably a little more scientific and mm-hmm. uh, theory based there was a lot of applied stuff as well but I've learned I suppose I have learned more from ex- experiencing it um, <sighs> and just being being involved in teams and watching the things the different personalities and that was one of the great learns for me was that the uniqueness of every athlete you know you can't just go in with a oh this is how to work on your confidence because it won't, bullet points and this is, it work for Kev Mac yeah. but it won't work for Alan or it won't sure. work for for um, you know, for for someone else. So, so um, yeah, I, I got I would have got a lot of learnings out of out of my own uh, experiences. But again, it's trying not to sh- shove them down people's throats because you know it's people people pick up the things that's relevant for them. I'm gonna. I just wanna. I wanna read one quote that I read. You did an interview with Kieran Shannon before, um, and this just jumped off the page for me. You don't want me reading it, but so you said I can't tell you the amount of times my work. But I've sat down with athletes and they've said, I've never told anyone this, but... Yeah. How do you prepare for that? Uh, you, is that just part of the role or is that did that surprise you a little bit? Yeah, t- t- that definitely surprised me, yeah. yeah. Now, maybe I was probably maybe exaggerating a bit, but it does happen. No, but- um, and uh, it, it has happened to me uh, a lot, maybe, is, is, is might be the right phrase, but it has happened to me uh, 
a good few times. Um, so it's, I suppose when you do build a bit of trust uh, or uh, you know a bit of respect with with an athlete, mm-hmm. that they they do feel that you've got the skills that maybe can help you know guide them through uh, a p- particular tricky situation. These are kind of lifestyle things, like you know, or sometimes some fellas would say, e- even in terms of the sports side, go. I'm a bit reluctant to even say this, but geez, I'm very hard on myself because people have give off the the uh, Just keep your mask on and keep, keep it all your mask up. on. Yeah. Is right, yeah. So um, I'm proud to say that people would give me that gift of, of yeah. being of, of having know, an honest I conversation. I meant that as a as an absolute compliment. I think. Okay. Yeah, like, I know. <laughs> I think like from for even like if I say from my perspective as a player, I've been in the dressing room or uh, where I've been around psychologists, like. You might agree or you might disagree, but the first thing I want to know if for someone that's working with me is that they give a shit about me. Like, like they actually, mm. like, do you know, it's not just about getting me out on the pitch on Sunday so I can save a shot or I can, like, kick a 45 oh, yeah. over the bar. Like, but actually, like, you know what, that person cares about me. And the second thing, and this, this is the compliment I'm getting at you, is that trust. And I think trust is probably, in any successful team, is one of the most important things. Yeah, it probably is. And again, it's a skill for me that I don't, in any way have mastered you know mm. I'm sure there's a lot of players that have uh, that wouldn't tell me you know anything about their lives um, again but it's about trying to you know you know be be, be more approachable maybe or to be to be more uh, understanding of of different people and whether it's different cultures or just different backgrounds or whatever it is so it's 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 one of the key things it's something that I, I'm certainly going after my own personal development is that having having more you know, genuine conversations with people, uh, and you know, being able to yeah, just accept people who for for who they are and being being real about it. You know, not <laughs> I'm robbing your language now. Real, <laughs> real talks. Yeah, real yeah. talks. Yeah. Yeah, people think you're on commission. Yeah. Um, I suppose earlier on you touched upon the time and the balance, and even I'm I'm acutely conscious of that. I've spent the first half of this interview sort of talking about sports and and GA and your playing career and all that, but I'm also fully aware that. There's a lot more going on in your life. You've got different skills and different attributes. I suppose one of the biggest questions that I have in terms of being, particularly a Dublin footballer, which is a like you know, it's a tier one team. It's it's top of the it's top of the ranks, and I think it's fair to say that you look you absolutely love your sport and you and you really enjoy playing for Dublin. But how important is it for you to to maintain that balance um, between on field life and off the field life? And I suppose the second question that I have is, how do you do that? Yeah, well, I suppose it's it's kind of a it's, a it's a skill. I suppose I've probably developed, um, and the reason I've developed it is that I realised that being a, an all out footballer wasn't doing me any favours, wasn't helping me play well at football, and it wasn't giving me a life when things went wrong. You know, yeah. so for for the first probably three years of my career, I would have just it was all football. My job was were you Kev Mack the footballer? That was you. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was my whole ups and downs were completely linked to my ups and downs in the football field um, I felt her pain in that regard yeah, yeah well I mean I was the same so that's, many, why, that's why I ask as well I was yeah, saying, like, but so many people are and you're just you're in this world where you're, you believe that the, the GA is everything mm. and you know I, I, I love it I give my all to it because I love I love playing uh, but I just learn you know you have a few when, when if you have an injury or something sure. what do you do like do you have do you have an edge with so it's, it's I kind of just gradually learned that when I was pronouncing the other side of my life uh, life that I enjoyed not only was I ha- happier in general but I actually was playing better yeah, that's, I think that's the big like, I'm yeah. just going to say that to you because I found even myself like we're both like I think we're, we're similar to that football at one stage was dictating how we are how, like, how our life was like, you know, if things were going well on the field things I sort of used to say things were going alright off the field mm. but I think that point you made is so important that I, I think it's when stuff is off the field is right and in balance and you, things are going well, I find, and, and again, I just, if you, I'd like to know what you think about it, is actually playing football then just becomes you get a chance to express yourself mm. and, and to do something that you enjoy doing rather than clinging to it, going, I better play well so I feel good during the week. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm getting at? Totally, yeah. And I think when you are more relaxed, I think you're more resilient and you can you can think a lot clearer. And it's a, it's a big leap for people because people love playing well so much. Mm. You know, they love playing well, they love getting better so much that they try and really control it. And one of the things I've learned is that actually letting go of it and letting you be, and having a more natural, instinctive approach to football is actually how you, you know, maximise your potential. 
Um, and that's a very difficult thing for people to let go of, is to let go of the control of their own improvement and their own performances. So um, I think that was a big leap that I, t- that I took. And I'm still taking every day, yeah, you know, course, don't yeah. get me wrong, I'm still a, cause still a big part of me that's a control freak and I want to get better and I, I, whether it's, you know, setting goals and whether it's being, you know, looking for an edge um, every way I can. Um, but I do know, particularly on match on match days, I know letting go and, um, you know, just taking on the chin, whatever happens, is a great way for me to play better and, again, for me to be more resilient. So if something does go wrong, you're not spending weeks thinking about it. So whether, whether you play good or whether you play bad, What's your outlet then? Because it's sort of getting at the balance thing here. Where do you get that from? What? How do you keep that in check? Um, I suppose, but what do I do outside? Like, I have a huge interest in psychology. I have a huge interest in mental health. Uh, and to do kind of with the brain and behaviour change and people. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of uh, upskilling in terms of what I know. Uh, whether it's reading books, whether it's meeting coaches, whether it's, you know, doing different... Um, Training courses that I've been on, I've tried every sort of training course you can imagine um, to improve me as a, um, you know, as a, as a mental skills coach, I suppose, from meditation to mental imagery to how to train, yeah. how people learn, to public speaking and things like that. Um, and and well, music is probably my biggest outlet. Okay. Uh, music is probably the big thing. So I love playing a few tunes, play with my brother and my mate, Mark. What do you play? Um, I play uh, mandolin and okay. banjo, yeah. So um, that's just uh, that's just something I love. I absolutely, grown up listening to a lot of Irish music, and um, it's funny. I was looking at me, the bands I listen to are all kind of tend to be Irish bands. Now it doesn't, it's not necessarily folk or trad, which I do love. Yeah, but it's um, even high and homegrown Irish rock bands. Sure, that are are, are are just people I love listening to. So um, and I play a bit, play a couple of gigs a week and things of like that. Where do you play? That's a great release. Uh, I've played in. In a temple bar around those areas. Um, my, my younger brother does it every night, and he's a so kind it's of. So it's you and your brother, is it two or someone else? My younger brother. Well, there's three of us in it, but okay. two of us do the yeah. gigs. It's, so there's no mate. So you can some, roll in, roll out. No, during the summer now, I wouldn't be doing as many. Okay. Uh, but look, it's grand. I, I initially, um, initially when I started it, I was like, you know, I wanted something extra, you know, and mm. and it was there was a reason for it at the time, but I love it. Get to hang around my brother. I don't. I don't live there at yeah. home anymore. I get to hang around with him, or get to hang around with my mate Swainer, who um, you know, three of us a great crack together, and it's just it's just a nice little release for and me. That's what I say. I presume if it's the Temple Bar vibe, like is it just a, is it just a space where you just get the zone out for a little while? Is that a fair summary of That's it? That's it. Yeah, yeah. So, like for me, and I, and I'm trying to I'm itching to find different areas yeah. where, like you know, some people love doing a bit of art. Some people love going out. Um, whatever it is going swimming or going jumping in the sea or whatever it is and um, that's just that's that's my thing that helps me helps me chill like you could play guitar for two hours and not what tunes are we talking about are we playing um, what do you want like we, we, we <laughs> play it all like, um, no it's kind of mainly like, I love the pogues and things like that and yeah. kind of a couple of jigs and reels but it's mainly it's mainly um, songs so we sat down and said what are the uh, what are the 40 songs if we were down there drinking two points of Guinness what yeah. would we like to hear so We've probably seven or eight Pogue songs, a bit of Demo Dempsey, um, anything from kind of going cro- like old school then, like Bruce Springsteen. Okay. Like things like, just thing kind of popular rock songs and yeah. we love to play. So Bonnie Iver or Kings of Leon. Or, and it's mainly tourists in and around there, is it? Mainly, yeah. So we, we do the odd gigs so, kind of around the city as well. But like I don't overdo it now, maybe one a week, but it's a nice release again. Sean, my bro, does it, does it a lot more. Okay. Um, so it, no, it's cool though. It's uh, it's just a nice little edge, and particularly in Temple Bar, there's no no one has ever mentioned the word football. That's what I was going to say to you, and I think that's because I think when you say escape, and like I imagine you, like let's say you come down to I bring you down to to Bailey, we're on Cavan down to my local. Like I, if you play music and everyone think oh that was great, but I'd say as soon as you finish, if you're hanging out for a point, everyone's going to be annoying you about football, not talking about music. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it must be so nice to actually get that little. Yeah. Oh, that it is, is based within your like, it is cool. and it's it's actually structuring because we all know like like and every coach will tell you now don't be worrying about football for the next <laughs> few days for a big game but it's actually what do you fill that space with you know and some people go to cinema some people hang around with their mates their mates are still going to ask them about football I know yeah. I remember the lads like 
he told the story of the night before the 2011 final we were just chilling out and we were playing a couple of tunes and they, there was about four or five of us and they were like really relaxed when I was in the room and then like I'd go out to the jacks and I only heard this after it and they'd be like oh my god how is he so relaxed what's he doing and I go, we were all, they were all wound up at the they're match they're all freaking so out so they like. talked about the match for three minutes while I'm out in the bathroom and then they'd come in and then they'd pretend to be chill again yeah so um, you know I, I again it's just you know my one of my things is I can't really become any better close to a game yeah. but I can become worse by sure. overthinking so uh, you know it's 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 a kind of tip the cap to my own confidence that uh, I, I, that's why I do it so I try and say listen get away from football you're you're a good baller mm-hmm. whatever happens tomorrow happens just chill you know I think I think your love of music comes across really strongly there and for me like it's I think it must just be so like it must be so nice just to have that release and that escape and I suppose there's another, there's another topic I want to get on to and I, I was doing my research again last night and I'm going to read you I'm going to read you two lines from a song and see if it, if, if, you're, if you know what it is first and foremost and then mm. we can bounce on to where, where I think it's going to go to but the, the words I've picked out was it breaks my heart that you went so far to all young people be proud of who you are you're smiling there do you know yeah it? yeah I got a shiver there yeah absolutely <laughs> Chris um, and Stevie yeah Geez, you're doing your research, yeah, yeah, no <laughs> Take messing. Take it seriously. Um, <laughs> Friday, like, I, 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 I didn't really know that song, and I've, 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 I've heard it mentioned before. It's obviously it's Damien Dempsey. Yeah, yeah. But for anyone sort of listening that hasn't heard heard those before, would you, would you just give a quick sort of backstory on the song or what it is, or yeah, or yeah. how you come across it or why you love how it? How really? I come across, I suppose, um, just of a great love for Damien Dempsey. He, he's he's um, he's a true dub he's a, he's a warrior he's as tough as nails yeah. um, but he has that edge to him that uh, I love to see in blokes is that he's able to have real conversations but I'm robbing your quotes no, again <laughs> but um, I suppose that one is about his two friends and yeah. both of them two, two more young people uh, cut down from a rope like mm. it's a rough rough song uh, about how they were you know they were the tough men they kind of turned I think it was crime or whatever they turned to whatever it was and um I suppose he's trying to spread that message and it's it's a song in two parts and one of them is is uh that after that line to all young people be proud of who you are there's a change in the whole song mm-hmm. uh from you know a, a kind of a straightforward storytelling thing sure. to a an uplifting hopeful musical thing where he says you know he gives a solution which is talk yeah. to me and tell me how you feel it's um, beautiful like i actually I was listening to it last night and it, st- it struck a chord with me for a few obvious reasons one was um, like I actually I grew up in Donegal, so uh, okay, I actually okay. I grew up listening. My older brother he was in the converted attic in the house, and he took he he went full on demo. I used to like he'd be heading off to work in the morning, yeah. and I'd be waiting to go to school, and Dave would be blaring out these tunes. So I know I know lyrics to all the different songs, but I actually never heard that one before. And mm. I listened to it the first time, and like you said, it just sort of went over my head, and I was like, I'm not sure because I didn't. I wasn't fairness. I hold my hand up. I wasn't really listening to it. Yeah, yeah. I was sort of doing a few different things. I was on the back, and I was like, oh, I don't know. Mm. And I was listening to it. I listened to it two or three times, and at one stage, like I actually start feeling like the emotion hit me a little bit and I was like this song is like this song is it like this is this is the shit like yeah um, I suppose you, like that sort of um, it really got me thinking around sort of the mental health space and I think you know and I know it's, it's probably a, a, a passion that we share mm. around education for particularly in young people I think I suppose that song just it really got me thinking um, I suppose it was just because I, I knew I wanted to talk about music and that lit them lyrics just jumped out at me and I was yeah. like I have to bring that up that's but fantastic song. like it's, it's absolutely class and like I suppose the mental health piece and you mentioned you mentioned the word resilience actually earlier on and I suppose one of the questions I was going to ask you you've just what does resilience mean to you because it's something we hear all, all the time but if, some, if I say to you what is resilience what comes to your mind um, pretty question I suppose I think resilience is the is the presence of skills to kind of bounce back and face adversity in the right manner um, and I, I suppose and a lot of us some of us have just some of the skills naturally mm-hmm. to, to handle particular types of setbacks um, but we don't have the skills to deal with other ones some of us are very resilient naturally some of us ha- ha- have no kind of ability and are, are really struggle when things go wrong and we shy away from challenges and things like that so that's kind of I suppose resilience for me is that um, and when building resilience uh, it's it's about teaching people to the skills to to face to face adversity to face set challenges and setbacks 
and to uh, yeah, get, yeah, kind of upskill people. Yeah, I know it's just like resilient to something that I and I certainly like. My story is no, uh, it, it's been it's been out there before, and I, I think resilience is definitely something that you can build, and I'm still building it all the time, you know. Mm. Um, and one of the things I always talk about from in with groups, if it's if it's in with school groups or if it's in GA clubs, whatever, is that. Um, like I think it's really important that you know, we all recognise the four out of four of us have mental health. I think we always talk about the one and four and straight away it all goes to like the negative, like, you know, like depression, anxiety, bipolar, like, and there's loads of there's loads of different things on the spectrum. They're all really, really important, like mm-hmm. and that we know about them, that we understand them. But I suppose like when I talk about the four and four, the message I try to get across to people is that is that resilience piece. And you mentioned about building it there. I suppose I'm curious as to how, how how do you think how how does someone Joe so about there if listening to this that thinks you know I, I could do a bit a bit more soon give us a pointer or two to get them in the right direction. Um, I suppose it's it's kind of going and and trying to upskill yourself on mm. it and trying to learn more about it and what are the things that you have and what are the things you need to develop. Um, some people need to develop how they talk to themselves. Mm. So are they more likely to have unhelpful thoughts around challenges or or um, or helpful thoughts or helpful actions, you know, it's, it's something that we teach in, like I work with, do, do a couple of a couple of sessions a week with uh, AWARE yeah. in schools. And when we teach teenagers about um, some CBT techniques about how to actually uh, frame, frame their challenges, frame their stresses a bit differently. Just give us an example of, of, one, just one, of one of those. Just so let's say on the spot some, here, something but. even simple like... Um, uh, so they might... So let's say, let's say a young lad, fifth year and does, he doesn't get a text back from his girlfriend. Mm. Yeah. So what does he think immediately? Well, he thinks she's cheating on me. What's he feel? He feels upset or he yeah. feels sad. And what does he do? Well, the lads, when they're in their macho state, they tell me, oh, I'll text her, mate. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we kind of say, well, only helpful thoughts, only helpful actions, because yeah. you could do. So so that's that stuff pops into your head. I know. Yeah. What's more likely to pop in your head? She's cheating on me or, uh, you know, her dad made her put her phone down because she's up studying. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, but, yeah, but our mind can just take us to the negative our, our, straight our, away. Our mind goes and now that's a natural that's a natural yeah. reaction where we're naturally negative ne- negatively biased. Um, we used to need to be naturally negative biased. Mm-hmm. We don't need it anymore um, because the world has changed so much. So we actually need to be we need to be naturally more positive biased. Yeah. Um, so I suppose and that's that's a kind of a weighing scales yeah. in terms of you know if ten good things happen to you in a day and ten bad things happen to you. What are you spending more time thinking of? If you score a hat trick in a soccer game, but you miss an opener, what are you spending the night thinking of? You're spending time thinking of the opener yeah. that you missed, um, rather than going, Do you know what? I scored three it's unreal scored goals. Um, so I suppose it's kind of it's kind of trying to watch. It, it, it's watch, um, uh, uh, you know, the the, the, the uh, journey from your thoughts to your feelings to your mm-hmm. actions. And figuring out, well, is there anything I can change here? Is there, anything, is there any way I can frame this in a different way? Um, so that's one of the things that we that we work on no, in, I think, in, in, I think, in a way. Like, I think you've explained that really, really well. And I think so that I, certainly, I certainly feel fortunate that we got to share a classroom one of the days out in Terranure College. And not going like, to be straight up, not going to lie, but I just I came out of that just going, like, that day was class and I actually from my perspective that was something that you know I've done I've done an awful lot of those sessions over the years and I was actually I enjoyed so much having someone else there to bounce off and the, the thing and like obviously your, your input to that day was top class but the bit that I really loved that really stuck with me was was your concept of the man rules and I think you, you touched oh, yeah, yeah. you touched upon that there um, I suppose you yeah. might just actually you might just round up sort of what that discussion was or what went um, down your well, that was actually that was something that I was introduced to um, by by a group called the Sora yeah. Foundation, who 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 ran one of their workshops around that. And like if anyone's listening and hasn't heard of them, they absolutely need to check out the website. Yeah, yeah. Sure it's Tony Griffin, like, uh, who was an ex Clare yeah. hurler, and Carl Swan, who have set it up. But they've a really really cool um, approach a re- uh, to to uh, emotional resilience in mm-hmm. teenagers. And I suppose I just I just. Um, like the way the people that work there are, uh, uh, I, I feel like I feel like they're becoming the best versions of themselves. Um, but that was about uh, something, and I've seen um, stuff in uh, in Reach in Melbourne. Re- the Reach Foundation was set up by Jim Stein. Yes, and I suppose it's it's kind of I don't know who wrote the who wrote the man rules. I think because 
the rules are when you ask people what what should a man be like and he should be the what's the first one you think the, of well he should be tough yeah he should be a warrior he should be strong he should bring home the bacon don't bring, cry bring, don't cry bring home yeah. the uh, bring home the cash you bring know points. for the points <laughs> bring points and slag the lads you know yeah. um, and I suppose that concept is that um, you know there's days when you need that mm-hmm. there's days when you need that but I think that form of masculinity is failing men Um so you know there's, there's the side of men where they can they need to show a bit of vulnerability uh, a lot of people see it as a weakness I don't I see it as being a more rounded man you know knowing that today you know I have to be the warrior but you know maybe tomorrow I actually have to be a bit more honest with myself and kind of have um, have a look at what's actually going on and maybe maybe look for a dig out yeah. because we don't always know the answers particularly when we're feeling something if we're feeling angry uh, in a particular situation or we're feeling stressed we can't see the world through the same eyes as, as someone else. So that's why you need to you need to talk to someone when you're in those states. Um, so I think I, I love that um, that message is that, you know, particularly blokes, that, mm. that it's just, there's, there's, like, I don't want to repeat myself, but there's, there's a time to be, be the tough man. Yeah, of course there's there is. Time to, course there's a time to show strength. Maybe it's to your family mm-hmm. or maybe it's to your friends. And the sh- or maybe it's on the football pitch. Yeah. You don't want to show any weakness when something goes wrong, which is great. So that's when you scored five goals and well, my brain's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's also a time then that you know you need you need you need I need to dig out here. So yeah. um, that's, that's I, I, I think that that eats across and because I asked you about resilience and certainly from from my perspective the way the way I view and I I have I've no prof- I've no you know professional qualifications and that stuff or anything. But like my view of resilience now is that when things are going negatively or when things are going poorly and I recognise that that slide is going downwards. And I, I always use the scale of zero to 10, like where am I at? And for me, like if it's if it's negative thoughts or if it's depression or whatever it is, if that's starting to eat in and, and take me from seven to six to five, resilience to me is recognising that within one or two moves down the scale and going, okay, what's going on? How do I draw a line here? And then the resilience is, how do I creep forward one? And you know, I've got some of the stuff mm-hmm. for me and I think one of the biggest things that's worked for me over the years is, is connecting with people, is having proper conversations. I think it's something we've both touched upon already. And just, I suppose that leads me on to the Warriors of the Light Night, which you've run, you've run two now, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I ran a couple of them, I suppose, yeah, so. like, I remember, like, I was at the first and obviously I felt privileged and, and honoured to be there first and foremost and to speak was an absolute joy. I remember just walking out of that evening going, like, this is, this is the stuff, like, this is, we need more of this in Ireland. And I suppose just, just to ask you sort of the b- bit of background on that, where where the idea and the motivation came to do something like that, mm-hmm. and and why you did it, I suppose, because I think from a GA, particularly jump with GA players, and as you said, the man rules, you know, like get the ball, go past your man, put it over the bar, run out, for it, like pump your fist, and yeah, good luck. Talk to me a little bit about that because it's something that I, I found fascinating, and I think it's a brilliant concept, and I, I'd, lo- I'd love people to know more about it. Uh, yeah, well, I suppose uh, the Warriors of the Life kind of came from. Um, you know, me trying to, to kind of do just do something a bit different with mm. with the skills that I that, that I have, you know, and, and the, the values that I have, um, and I suppose like trying to learn to align those, align what you're good at to it to what's what what's the essence of you, and um, it kind what, of came, I suppose. We m- what is the essence of you before well, you go on to that? Well, geez, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out, <laughs> but, I, but I suppose it's it's trying to, I, I, to probably what it is is never had any real confidence mm. in myself. To go out and do things, sure. put me, but being on a successful football team and building, and get, let help me build confidence. And injects a bit into you. Yeah. And now I'm kind of saying, well, do you know what? I actually have confidence to do these things and, and to not be, not be as worried and to actually change. Yeah. So I, I'm just trying to try something new, I suppose. And then myself and um, my mate Mark, who's a teacher, uh, we went to an event that Pieta House ran mm-hmm. called called the Bounce of the Ball, and it was like ten speakers. 10 minutes Paul Flynn invited me along and it was just it was just basically it was just mind blowing the two of us left the place there was, there was like uh, Joe Castlin spoke at it who's an artist um, uh, Connor Cusack spoke who's a really really uh, mm-hmm. powerful speaker great, a great wordsmith and so just a real spread of, of men yeah, telling yeah, the stories men, was it? it it was all men it was for me international men's yeah. Jack McGrath spoke at it and uh, there was a poet kind of opened up the night and Owen McDermott spoke and um and, and they were just blokes just standing up there going, yeah, this is what's going on. This, this, is, this is what's going on. This is the story. And the two of us left there going, like, so energised mm. about, like, um, you know, just, just 
giving people a dig out, and that's what the whole night was about. Um, we just said, just imagine you could like make, imagine you could do that, like make a hundred people get a hundred people into the room. Because we said we said we're going to try and rob what we learned tonight and help ten people. Yeah. And then we kind of go, well, why would you think so small? Like, why would you not get a hundred people in the room and try and get them to help ten yeah. people? Um, and that's that, that's just where it kind of came from. And for me, I felt like I was good at running events. I love music, mm-hmm. and for me, behavior change. What well, what gets under my skin and gets into my heart is music. Mm. You know, is 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 the Damon Dempsey line. Yeah. You know, from all young people, be proud of who you are. That gets under my skin through a song a lot a lot easier than it does if someone just says it to me. Yeah, I get you. Because yeah. because whatever way art gets through our brains and into our hearts, that's that's what worked for me. So I so we just said, yeah, why don't we do? And he it, it, music and poetry. And then Mark said, do you know what? As well, when like there's a part of our Irish culture where storytelling was a big thing, and people used to have storytelling nights. So why can we bring that back? So that's where I kind of mashed it all into one. So me, poetry, song, and stories. Um, create spaces that are different nights out for people. There's no drink. Uh, there's places where there's a kind of a relaxed atmosphere. We can create a culture of compassion, and and just place where people can have honest conversations. You know, as, particularly as footballers, I definitely felt that wasn't probably part of our culture a number of years ago. I think it is creeping in, and I think it's creeping in across society. And I think we're getting as a country, we're getting an awful lot better. Are we? where we need to be? Absolutely not. And I suppose, I think it is slowly creeping up and it's getting better, but I suppose the question that I had for you was, how do we, how do we try and put a turbo rocket under that? How do we try and light that sort of compassionate fire for the want of a better phrase? Yeah, um, I, I, I find it very, it's a, it's a tough question. And again, mm. I don't, like I'm not, again, really that comfortable talking about um, mental health in terms of politics and in yeah. terms of schools like no, that. No, I'm because, the same, like. Because I, 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 I'm just not uh, well versed enough on it. Um, I do have a huge interest in you know what's going on in the brain and things like that. Um, so I suppose for for me, it's 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 if you can just create spaces to um, to be more be more relaxed, I suppose, and to be more. Um, be more honest with, mm. with what's going on so it, like it it is hard to know and like we uh, everyone keeps saying that it's it's getting better it's getting better but like I, I, I'm not 100% sure it is like I, cause really? I, I, well I'm worried I, I am worried about the way that um, like the, the, the pressure that a lot of teenagers are being put under in it's, terms of like you know when you're in the classroom as well some of the stuff mm. that comes up for me I'm like holy shit like yeah, you know? yeah I suppose it's just it's just and I just think maybe it's Maybe it's resilience. Maybe it's 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 how to, um, you know, you know, make the uncomfortable things a bit trendier. You know, to, uh, and it's 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 a hard thing to do. So I I don't really know, um, but I do think that we need to take much more of an interest in, in our uh, mental fitness, in our in our emotional resilience uh, as people. When you when you look at it's not just in sport. When you look at the difference in people when it's in terms of leadership, when it's in terms of success, it, it, it's not about it, like it's not about the, the the gifts they got from 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 God or wherever they got them. It's not it's not about but it's about it's about the skills that can be built. Like aren't they? like the skills that can learned. be built. And I mean it's. It's 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 lifting it's lifting weights for your brain. Like it's not lifting weights for your biceps. Do you know what I mean? Although uh, that that can be important at times. <laughs> it can be important. So I'm just trying to impress the monster. And um, no, like you know, like it's um, it's yeah, yeah, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, everyone is like there's a, there's a big okay, there's a big move, and it seems to be maybe it's just who I follow on Facebook and Twitter. It's like everyone's talking about eating healthy. Yeah, which is great. You know what I mean? Eating yeah, healthy because yeah. if you're eating eat cleaner, you're because because what's happening is there's more fast food and there's more eating healthy popping up. So people still don't know where to go. Yeah. Um, but it seems like to me you now I think maybe my world is warped because the you, the world you're in now is who you follow on sure, Twitter. Sure. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what you see what's going on. Um. So I probably I I, I think hopefully people will start putting a bit more weight on. The, the mental fitness side of things and the most in the most emotional resilience and the more intangible things um, about about ourselves that um, that make us who we are. Yeah, I think like I come back to the connection piece and I was talking about compassion and empathy there and like, just from my own life, my own experience, like I always like for me, compassion and empathy just starts with like about yourself in terms of self awareness. 
But then, like, in my mind, because like, people say, oh, like, don't, like, when you say a compassionate and, and, and empathetic society, people go, like, whoa, what's that? But I sort of take it back and be like, well, can I help have that with my friends and my family, first and foremost? Because, like, I look at my life as, like, me in the middle, the next circle is my family and friends, people I love and care for. Then there's, like, you know, the wider family and wider mm-hmm. and friends and teammates and all that. And I'm like, well, can I, if I just look after circle one and two, do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I think I'm going to go back to it. I'm going to go back to a quote here because I, li- I said I was listening to that tune a few times. You actually referenced it earlier on as well. But again, I listened to it and it was, it was talk to me and tell me how you feel. Lean on me. I'm here. My love is real. And that for me is like, that's the answer Like in, mm-hmm. my, in my life. Yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with you, like, the, the, just, the, just the whole political side and curriculums and all that. And I just, cause it's, and it's easy to get lost in that negativity, I think, but I just, mm. the, the, like, if I read that lyric out again, like, talk to me and tell me how you feel. Lean on me, I'm here. My love is real. Like, mm. like what does that shout out to you? What does, like, what goes through your mind when I read that out? Like, sorry, uh, that's, 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 that's the same song from David Yeah, James yeah, I suppose that's just, and that's just one of the, like, most quintessentially... Tough, I got tattooed that on my head. Like. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> one of the, 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 I suppose, our, our toughest exports from the city saying that. Um, and, yeah, I suppose it's just, I mean, that song is about, is about you know, male suicide. Mm. And, it, and it is, and, you know, there's, there is that uh, discomfort, whether it's embarrassment. I don't know what it is. Sorry, do I understand why people are looking to talk? Mm. Absolutely. I totally understand why, but I don't agree with it. And I think if if you could get that message, and I know there's um, there's uh, so many people that have stuff going on in their head, or stuff going on in their lives, and they're in situations where it's just there, it's just coming through their throat, into their mouth, onto their tongue, on and the right on the, edge of the palate there. But something holds it back. Mm. I I think that's you know it's years I've been told particular things. I've been told, get up out of that, don't be crying. Chin up, get up out of chin up, yeah, you know, and it's that's what's holding that mm. story back at the last minute and I think it's as Dan was just let go there's people there that are going to listen to you so just let go of that Thank little you. let go of that little um, whatever it is in your throat that's that, that's holding the words back just let go and um, and that's kind of the, that, that's that's a way out of, of what you're experiencing like I'd strongly I'd strongly encourage anyone who's listening to this to actually, uh, like, to go find that song and to spend, to, to give it five minutes and, and don't make the mistake I did, like, a dope of only half listening to it and yeah, sort of going, yeah. what's that? Actually go, do you know what, five minutes. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. And I suppose, just as I'm finishing up, Kev, I suppose one last question for you. And uh, I suppose we've talked through an awful lot there, from past, present. What's the what's the future look like for you, sitting here now, talking to me, looking at me? What's the what's the POA or where do you see yourself going? Um. It's a good question. I suppose I'm kind of just, um, uh, yeah, I'm kind of just seeing what happens. I don't know. I, I suppose I do want to be. Um, I want to be as good a uh, a coach uh, as I can in terms of in terms of coaching people, finding new ways to get better at that. Mm-hmm. Um, finding maybe new ways, maybe putting a bit more of a, an edge or a bit more of a spin on on the Warriors nights. It's kind of slowly becoming part of who I am, and to. As always, you know, see the be the best I can be on the football pitch, and maybe figure out where I'm going to get my next adventure from. You know how can, how I can, um, you know, maybe experience something completely new that I haven't done yet. Um, uh, so, yeah, I suppose it's hard to know. I don't. I kind of don't have a few long term goals, but in terms of the future, I try, I try and I try and look at adding a little edge to myself every day. Maybe that tier one, circle yeah. one. Uh, looking after myself as best I can, and then Jesus, I wasn't. I, I don't know what the future holds. Hopefully, it's more <laughs> you know, success in terms of like, football. It's success in terms of uh, my personal life, and it's um, yeah, I suppose some um, yeah, some some uh, some good challenges ahead. I very suppose. good. No, I only ask because I love when someone says to you like, you know, where do you see yourself in ten years? And you're like, I don't know what I'll be doing next year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but the people have been the people. <laughs> Overestimate what they can do in a year yeah. and underestimate what they can do sure. in five years. So it's it's important, I suppose, that I do have lofty values. Maybe I don't want to shout. Or maybe you're looking to shout them out. Oh, this, is, this is me holding back. I don't know what's telling me not to talk about this. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, look, I hope, hope to hope to get better every day. That's one of my big ones. Now, listen, first and foremost, best of luck with everything for the year ahead, on and off the field. I think some of the work you're doing off the field is making a real 
really strong impact and, and positive influence if that's that's in dress rooms or if that's with individuals or if that's the warriors of light night like sincerely best of luck with all that the last thing i just like to say is to actually thank you for doing this today for having for having that conversation with me i think a few of the key strands that come up all the time is is real talks of meaningful conversations of compassion empathy um and i just think you just you spoke well, so well across those topics and i'm sure anyone who's listening today who like you said sometimes gets to those stages where the things on the tip of the tongue and they're like will i won't i i hope what we've talked through today is will help someone actually you know go do you know what actually i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to someone i trust about that or i'm gonna say this or i'm gonna say that to me manager or i'm gonna say that to me to me teammate or whatever to the wing back who's not doing his job all those things that we get in our tip of the tongue we shrivel up um but no just genuinely thanks a million for that i think there's, there's just there's an awful lot there i think people people have an opportunity to take away a huge amount from that um, and just to thank you for your time I know you're a busy man oh, and as I said best luck with everything going forward and we'll talk to you again so thank you spot on Damn it. so that's it for this week's episode and I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kevin as much as I did make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes by heading over to realtalks.ie forward slash podcast that's realtalks.ie forward slash podcast to subscribe to the show on whatever platform suits you. If you want to get in touch on Twitter, you can get me at AOM the cat, that's AOM the cat, or through Real Talks IRL. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Alan O'Mara official or forward slash Real Talks IRL. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Kelly Bradshaw Dalton, for supporting this podcast. Over the years, they've gone above and beyond to help me find suitable accommodation and their customer service is second to none. To find out more about them and available properties, go to kbd.ie. My name is Alan O'Mara and you've been listening to an episode of the Real Talks podcast.